I really believe that. You know, Paul and I just got through with a, a vacation and I enjoyed it. I spent 10 days down in Cancun and it was nice. But you know what? I was so excited to get back. When I got into class on Tuesday and started teaching, I told the students, I said, man, I love this. I love being here. I hate being gone. I don't know why I ever go anywhere else. I just love what God has called me to do. And I enjoyed the vacation and I needed it. I'm not saying that you don't take breaks, but I'm saying you ought to be enthused. You ought to be pumped up about what you're doing. If you have to drag yourself to work, if you're having to force yourself to go through things, you have not found God's will. Or if you found it, you let the devil take you out of faith. You aren't recognizing where you are. But I'm saying it ought to be energizing to you when you're in the center of God's will. Man, you ought to be excited. And I just know in my heart that there's a lot of men right here that that is not the case with you. I'm not trying to discourage you. I'm trying to encourage you that God has an awesome plan for your life, a better plan for your life than what your plans are. And yet again, many of us limit. We look at our own natural abilities and we allow life to just beat us down. You know, I was just teaching recently on this, but uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 17, when David stood up and said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? His own brother, Eliab, was the very first one to say, what are you doing? Who have you left these few sheep with? And, and they began to criticize him. Jesus said this exact same thing, that a prophet is not without honor except in his own house and in his own country and among his own kin. Did you know that when you start trying to say, God's got a purpose for my life, I'm going to succeed. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to prevail. I'm going to overcome things. The people around you and sometimes your own family will be the very ones to start criticizing you and putting you down. And there's multiple reasons for it. But you know, one of them is that if you succeed and you're from the same gene pool and you're from the same environment and if you succeed, then it makes them look bad. And so they've got to draw you down. They've got to bring you down to their level because uh, if, if God could use you, he could have used them. It's a lot easier to pull you down than it is for them to come up to your level. And so really, if you understand it that way, persecution is a compliment. If you throw a rock into a pack of dogs, the one that yelps the loud, loudest got hit. And the people who persecute you the most are the people who are under pressure. And so what they're going to do is try and discredit you so that they can discredit the message and get out from under the conviction. But I'm telling you, there's some of you that you know God has something more, but people around you are just constantly drawing you down and telling you to settle for less. Just take it easy. I tell you, we're playing it way too safe. You know, I spend millions of dollars. We got Doug Nees here. He's my media buyer. He could tell you. We spend, I forget, but it's over a million dollars a month on television and radio and... Um, <laughs> I'm doing a lot of things and we're reaching a lot of people, but every one of you here have people under your influence that'll never hear of me, that I'll never reach. And if I spent 10 times as much money as I've got, I'll never reach the people that you reach. And if you don't reach your potential, if you don't start thinking bigger, if you don't let God inspire you and show you something then there's all kinds of people that are going to fall through the cracks. You're the one that has their miracle. You're the one that God wrote in his book that you were supposed to touch those people that you work with, the neighbors that you live next to, your family members. You're the one that it's written down that you're supposed to reach them. I can't reach them. And if you don't reach your full potential, there's going to be people that will die and go to hell. There will be people who will stay sick. There'll be all kinds of things that'll happen if you don't reach your potential. Brothers, every one of you in here is important. One of the big mistakes we've made in the body of Christ is to put certain people in the clergy and they're the ones that God is going to use and all we do is just warm a pew and wait on them to do everything. 
You know, I don't know how many people we have here, but it's well over 1,000, 12, 1,300 or whatever. And you know, if every person in here was to get fired up this week and to start believing God and start walking with God and let God flow through you and give you creative ideas, and if you started living up to your full potential and doing those things that were written in God's book before you were ever born, I guarantee you, I believe that this could change the entire nation. There's lots of people that you influence. If we all went back to our sphere of influence and we're living this, it would make a radical difference. And again, some of you are thinking, oh no, I don't have that kind of influence. You would if you were walking in the supernatural power of God. You know, Jesus said, if you're believing on him, the works that he did, will you do also and even greater works than these. And this isn't talking to just preachers. It says, if you are believers, if you believe on him, I guarantee you, if every one of you went out of here and raised somebody from the dead, we'd have all the revival we could handle. But what we do is we're spending our time praying and saying, oh God, move. Oh God, do something. And God's praying that you'll move. Amen. He's praying that you will find out your potential, that you'll begin to start living up to it. And again, brothers, you could touch people that I'll never touch, that these other pastors here will never touch. It is just imperative that you begin to live up to what God called you to do. And I know some of you are thinking, man, this is just putting condemnation on me and showing me that I'm a a loser. I haven't done what God wants me to do. That's not my intent. But I'm saying that you're never going to change as long as you are satisfied where you are. You've got to have a holy dissatisfaction. You've got to get to a place where I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. And brothers, you can do this. You don't have to be the sharpest knife in the drawer. I'm proof of that. Man, if I was God, I wouldn't have chosen me. And yet God is just blessing me and using me and people's lives are being changed. I had probably a dozen people as I walked through here tonight tell me about how that their life was totally changed and things have happened. And if God can use me, he can use anybody. Matter of fact, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 and following, it says, you see your calling, brother, and it's not many mighty, not many noble, not many wise men after the flesh, but God hath chosen the weak things of the world, base things of the world, things that are despised, things that are nothing to bring to naught, things that are. And it says the reason he does it that way is so that no flesh would glory in his presence. God delights in using people that in the natural can't do it so that when God flows through them, people say, this has got to be God. It can't be that person. So if you feel like you are unqualified, if you feel like your base despise nothing, you qualify. Amen. The only people God can't use are the people that aren't dependent upon God. The people that think that they can do it on their own. Man, if you feel like, how could God use me? I'm a child. How could I speak? You're the very person that God wants to use. I'm telling you, God can energize you. God can do supernatural things through you. There's not a person in here. I don't care what's going on in your life. That God couldn't change you. That God couldn't energize you. But it's not going to happen with you just floating downstream. It's not going to happen with you just going through life and letting circumstances control your life. You are going to have to take control. You are going to have to start seeking God. And you know, the very fact that you're here means that, man, you are seeking God or either somebody who is seeking God drug you here. One of the two. But you aren't the nod to God crowd. You are here looking for something more. And you just need to do this not on, in spurts. You know, the scripture says the just shall live by faith. You don't need to visit there, vacation there. Just go to a man's advance one time a year. You need to live by faith. This needs to be the way that you are constantly seeking God. And I promise you, when you do that, it says in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil. To give you an expected end, the NIV says a hope in a future. That verse is confirming everything I'm saying. God 
has good thoughts towards you, thoughts of peace. God never created a single person to fail. That is not what he wrote in your book. That is not written down. That is not God's plan for a single person. His thoughts are peace towards you to give you an expected end. I like the NIV when it says a hope in a future, but I, I like the King James. Because, you know, when it says you have an expected end, that means that I know what my end's going to be like because I've been seeking God and He said He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him and so I know that I'm going to win. I can expect that. I don't have to just do the best I can and hope that it works out. Man, I have an expected end. I'm not going to go out with a whimper. I'm going to go out with a shout. Yeah. I'm going to say with the Apostle Paul, I've run the race. I've finished my course and I know that there is a reward for me. I'm expecting that. And then right after that, in verse 12, it says, And you shall seek me. This is verse 13, I think. You shall seek me, and you shall find me when you shall search for me with all of your heart. All of your heart. There are people that will seek the Lord in spurts, and if your back's up against the wall and you know that you can't pull this thing out on your own, you'll ask God to help you temporarily. But God looks on the heart, 1 Samuel 16, 17. God looks on the heart. He knows whether you are, you know, giving it everything you've got or not. But when you seek with all of your heart, you'll find Him. I've had people tell me, well, I asked and nothing happened. Well, God is waiting on you to seek with all of your heart. Here's another way of saying it. As long as you can live without knowing God's perfect will and without you fulfilling God's perfect will, you will. But when you reach that place to where I've had it, I'm not living this way anymore. God will come through. But you have to seek with all of your heart. You know, Moses was seeking the Lord and he says, Oh God, show me your glory. And God says, I will be with you and I will go with you. And Moses, this is Exodus chapter 33, I believe. And Moses said, Lord, if you don't go with me, I'm not moving. That's where we need to get to be. God, I'm not going to go through life. I'm not just going to do what everybody else is doing. I'm driving a stake right here and I'm not moving until I know what your will is. And you know, the good thing is, it says in Ephesians chapter 5 that be not ignorant, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. That's a command. Right after it's talking about don't be drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. It says, don't be ignorant, but understand what the will of the Lord is. The Lord wouldn't have given us that command if He didn't want to reveal His will to us. God wants you to know what His purpose for your life is more than you want to know it. But it doesn't get revealed to us with, when you're passive, when you're weak. You've got to become aggressive. You've got to get to where you pursue the things of God. I can guarantee you this, brothers, that it's not God who has failed a single person in here. God is faithful. But it says there is a way that seems right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. It says in Proverbs chapter 3, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. In all of your ways acknowledge Him and He shall direct your paths. The only reason that we aren't all experiencing God's best in our life is not because God doesn't have a plan and not because God isn't faithful. It's because we have done it our way. Us and Frank Sinatra. We did it our way. Let me ask you, how's that working? I can guarantee you, brothers, that any problem that we've got in our life, it's because you did it your way. And I know that there's some people saying, no, that's not true. I mean, I've got sickness in my body and I didn't have a thing to do. I didn't cause sickness. Man, I hope you'll track with me right here. Some people don't, can't connect these dots. But it's true that, you know what, you may not have thought, all right, I want to have cancer. All right, I want to have this sickness. I want to have poverty. I want to have this. You may not have asked for it. You may not have gone out and have planned on it, but you were thinking like a mere human being, thinking I'm only human and thinking that cancer is incurable and, well, it's flu season and so, it, you know, it, you just got to get sick. That's wrong. It's wrong thinking. 
You may not have thought ways that, it, that brought it because you asked for it, but when it came, because we live in a fallen world, you were thinking in a way that limited what God could do. You accepted the sickness. You accepted poverty. You accepted these things. It says in Romans chapter 8, verse 6, to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Man, that, that didn't say that carnal mindedness produces death for some people, sometimes. No, it's just, it's an equation. Carnal mindedness equals death. Spiritual mindedness equals life and peace. And so based on that scripture, I can say that if you are experiencing death, any form of death, this doesn't have to be ultimate death where you quit breathing and we go to be with the Lord. But you know, depression is death. Anything that came as a result of sin is death. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. Anything that came as a result of sin, poverty, depression, sickness, sorrow, grief, bitterness, unforgiveness, uh, anything you want to mention, if you are experiencing any form of death, it's because you were carnally minded. Again, that doesn't mean that necessarily you're a terrible person, but you're just thinking like a natural, normal person. You aren't just natural. If you are born again, you are a brand new person on the inside. You are now have the spirit of God living on the inside of you. If you don't have Jesus living in you, we're going to give you an opportunity to fix that tonight. Amen. But if you are born again and have the spirit of God on the inside of you, well, then you are a world overcomer. And you should be able to see this power manifest. It's already there, but you've got to think that way. And the problem is, man, this is frustrating to me because I would like to say five things all at the same time. Let me share this with you out of Galatians chapter 5. I'm going to give you your answer to whatever your problem is real quickly. So it's going to be so simple, some of you are going to think, oh, oh, no, that's not my problem. It's more complex than that. This is how simple it is right here in Galatians chapter 5 and in verse 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's how simple it is. Whatever problem you've got, it's your flesh that's the problem. Now, I'm aware that not everybody here is on the same page. The Bible, when it's talking about flesh, isn't talking about skin like what we often talk about. The word flesh, the Greek word is sarx, and it's, you can go into a lot of things, but it basically is talking about your physical body and your soulish part that isn't renewed, that's not redeemed yet. Uh, when you got born again, you were given a brand new spirit. And in the spirit, you are a completely brand new person, but we have a mind that didn't instantly change. You know, when you got born again, if you were fat when you got born again, you're still going to be fat after you get born again. Your body didn't change. And you know what? Before you got born again, you had your memories and you had things that happened to you and your mind was filled with all of those things. When you get born again, your mind doesn't instantly change. You still got the same mind. You got your memories, not my memories. You don't instantly think right. That's your flesh, your soul and your body combination that has not been renewed by the Spirit of the Lord. But in the Spirit, you're a brand new person. So the answer is just this simple. In the Spirit, you are identical to Jesus. You got His attitude. You got His ability. You've got the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead living on the inside of you. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19, 18 and 19. He's praying that your eyes would be open, that you would see the exceeding greatness of his power towards you. The same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Brothers, you still, you have the same power on the inside of you that raised Jesus from the dead. That ought to be enough to handle whatever your problem is. The average Christian says, oh God, I know that you're all powerful. I know that you can do anything. Oh God, would you please move? You know what? You're thinking carnally. You're thinking that you're just a mere human being 
and that you can do nothing, and so God, would you please move? You've already started from unbelief. Because if you've been born again, you are now a new person in Christ. You have His power and authority. The Lord told you to resist the devil, and he will flee from you, not from God. He placed His power in you. You are the mobile office of Jesus. You have His power and authority, and you have to resist the devil. You have to release this power. Instead of saying, oh God, stretch forth your hand and heal this person. He says, you lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. He says, you go cast out devils, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers and raise the dead. He told you to do it. And some of you are thinking, I could never do that. You're carnal. You are looking at the flesh. You are looking at yourself. The key to the Christian life. Any problem that you've got, it's because you are approaching things out of your ability, out of your intellect, out of your power. But I'm telling you, brothers, it's just simple. When you get born again, you become a brand new person and you have the life of God on the inside of you. You can do anything, anything, anything that God wants you to do. There is no limit when you are walking in the spirit Instead of walking in your flesh, in your own mental ability, in your own physical strength. And you know, this is one of the liabilities of guys. Guys just think, you know, we're tough. We can do this. Women as a whole, I know there's a lot of women watching tonight. But as a whole, women recognize their frailty more than men. They aren't trying to be macho. Now, sad to say, well, you see role reversals and... <laughs> Things are changing, but I'm saying as a whole, women are more receptive to realizing their need for God. And that's why women tend to turn to the Lord quicker than men because men are going to take care of it themselves. They're going to do it their way. Man, we had Jeremy Pearson's uh, minister with us in uh, January, and he preached an awesome, awesome message on who cares and it was all about you're supposed to cast your care over on the Lord. And he was talking about who cares. And anyway, there were some great examples that he gave. But who was this that got up and, man, I wish I could remember who this was. But anyway, he was preaching on all of this. And somebody just got up and said something about that they can handle it. I can handle this. It's just like when we're trying to go someplace. Women will ask directions, but guys, no, I got this. We don't want to admit that we haven't done it. You know what that is? That's the flesh. When you are trusting in yourself, it limits the power of God flowing through you. You need to get to a place where you recognize that you are awesome in your spirit, man. But your flesh is not that good. It says in John chapter 6, verse 63, it's the spirit that quickens. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Did you know that's what Jesus said? Most guys, and this isn't limited to guys, but I think especially guys, most guys think that your flesh is awesome. That there's things you can do, that you are confident, you aren't going to admit failure. Jesus said your flesh profits nothing. He didn't say it profits a little. He says it profits nothing. You've got to get to where you walk in the Spirit. In the Spirit, you're perfect. In the Spirit, your Spirit is as perfect right now as it's ever going to be in eternity. You aren't going to get a new Spirit in eternity. You're going to get a glorified body and a renewed mind, but your Spirit is as perfect right this moment as it will ever be. It says as Jesus is so are we in this world, 1 John chapter 4, verse 17. That's not talking about your body. Your body's going to have to be changed. That's not talking about your mind. Your mind's got to be renewed. But in the Spirit, you are identical to Jesus. 1 Corinthians six seventeen. He that is joined unto the Lord is one Spirit. Your spirit is as perfect, as pure as Jesus. 1 Corinthians two sixteen says you have the mind of Christ. Some people will say, man, I don't. I can't even find my glasses sometimes. I, I forget all kinds of things. 
That's talking about this peanut-sized brain up here. But in your spirit, you have a mind. You know all things. First John chapter 2, verse 20, you have an unction from the Holy One and you know all things. Man, I'm putting out a lot. It's taken me decades to learn these things and I'm just spewing it out and expecting everybody to get it. Let me give you an example that, you know, when we were building a place down in Colorado Springs, long story, but I needed $3.2 million to finish that building. And for nine months, the banker told me, you'll have your money next week. And he told me that every week for nine months. And finally, at the end of nine months, we had a meeting with him. And he says, you know, it's been so long. Let's just start the process over. Let's get a new appraisal and start over. And all I could see was nine more months. And I said, this isn't right. And so I said, time out. I'm going to pray something's wrong. And so I went home and there's a scripture that says, when you pray in tongues, it's your spirit praying. 1 Corinthians 14, 14 and 1 Corinthians 14, 13 says, when you pray in tongues, pray also that you interpret. So your spirit is the part of you that has a mind to Christ. This isn't talking about your physical mind. In your spirit, you have a supernatural ability to know the things of God. And when you pray in tongues, you're praying the hidden wisdom of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 through 9. You're praying the hidden wisdom of God. So all you got to do is pray that you interpret. So I said, I'm going to find out what's wrong. And I, said, I quoted those verses and I said, Father, I'm going to pray in tongues and I, I'm asking you to give me an interpretation. And I didn't get much further than from here to the back of this auditorium before God reminded me of a prophecy that I'd gotten two years before that I had just forgotten. And it says, in all of these things that God was leading me to do, He says, you aren't going to need to take out a loan. And I remember when they said this. You know, Dennis was, was there and heard this. And um, says, you won't need to take out a loan. And I was thinking, why not? And he says, because you got a bank. And I thought, what bank do I have? And then the next phrase was, your partners are the bank. You can't build enough to outdo your partners. Your partners will supply everything debt free. So I was saying, God, what's wrong? I prayed in tongues to ask for an interpretation. And immediately he brought back to my remembrance his prophecy. And I thought, God, are you telling me that you want me to get this done without a loan? $3.2 million. And at that time, that was back in 2002 or three. Um, at the rate money had been coming in and we had been saving, I sat down and, and figured it out. I'd have been like 120 years old by the time we were able to get. And I thought, God, this does not make sense. Something's going to have to change. Am I sure this is you? And yet every time I prayed about it, I just had more excitement about this. And so I made a decision. I said, you know what? If they come and offer me all the money I need tomorrow, I refuse it. I'm going to do this debt free. Sure enough, the next day, they said, all right, you're approved. We got it for $4 million. They said, you need more than the 3.2. And they approved me for $4 million. And I said, you're too late. And I turned it down. And did you know in 14 months from that day, we moved into that building debt free. And then we've done all of this here, $75 million debt free on top of our normal expenses. And I'm telling you, it was because in my spirit, I already had these things. And all I had to do was quit walking in the flesh, quit dealing with things in the natural, quit trying to figure it out through just natural means. And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, this is so simple. Most people miss it. But this is really how simple it is. In your spirit, you've got everything that you need. You've got all the wisdom that you need. You've got all of the anointing that you need. You've got all of the joy and peace. Matter of fact, right here in this context, just a few verses down, the fruit of the spirit. This is telling you what's in your spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. You've already got this. People are saying, oh God, just give me joy. How can God give you something that he's already given you? Oh God, I just need joy. <laughs> it just doesn't work that way. 
You know, right here, I just gave Daniel my Bible. So Daniel's got my Bible. And if Daniel would say, oh, Andrew, give me your Bible. How do you respond to somebody who's asking for something that you just gave them? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I wouldn't know how to respond. I'd probably just... I'd probably just stand here and wonder what's wrong with Daniel. Kind of like God's response to you. You're praying and asking for something and you don't hear a thing. What's going on? Give me my Bible. It's because if God could be confused, God would be confused. I can imagine the father looking over at Jesus and saying, didn't you tell them that I've given you all things? You're blessed with all spiritual blessings. Why are they asking to be healed? Didn't you tell them that by your stripes they were healed? Why are you asking God to do what he's already done? I know some of you are thinking I'm making a big deal out of nothing, but it's, it is a big deal. You are asking God to heal you. Why? Because you don't believe he did what he said he'd do. Well, I can prove to you he didn't do it. Right here's my doctor's report. All the doctor can do is, is check your flesh. They can't see what... in your spirit in your spirit you have the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead you got raising from the dead power on the inside of you and your answer is as simple as walking in the spirit instead of in your flesh but my flesh hurts well forget it don't let your flesh dict- well how can I do that Man, you have been empowered to live in the Spirit. God would be unjust to tell you to walk in the Spirit if you can't do it. Well, what is walking in the Spirit? Some people think it's walking around with your hands folded like this or your collar turned around backwards. That's not walking in the Spirit. Again, Jesus said, it's the Spirit that quickens the flesh, profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are Spirit And they are alive. Do you want to know what walking in the Spirit is? It's walking in the Word. What does the Word say? The Word says, by His stripes you were healed. Not are going to be healed or can be healed. You were healed. And you put that together with Ephesians 1.19 where you have the same power on the inside of you that raised Jesus Christ from the dead and many other scriptures. It's a done deal. You've already got it. But it's in your spirit. And you've got to walk in the Spirit. You've got to walk in what God's Word says. And yet most people are more moved by the Word of a doctor than you are by the Word of God. I'm not against doctors. I'm sure we've got doctors in here. If it wasn't for doctors, all the Christians would be dead. They hadn't been trusting God. But I'm saying, man, why don't you just draw on this supernatural life and leave the, you know, the doctors for the sick people? Amen. I'm not against veterinarians. But I wouldn't take my dog to a vet. You know why? Don't have a dog. (laughs) If you're taking your dog to a vet, that's fine. But you know, I don't have a dog. The reason I don't go to a doctor is because I'm not sick. Even when I feel sick. Even when my body tells me I'm sick. I'm walking in the Spirit and the Spirit says that I was healed And I am going to believe that. I don't care what it looks like. I believe what God spoke to me. God gave me a dream about Kenneth coming here and dedicating this building November the 3rd. Anyway, it's a long story, but 
I, I know it's a word from God. And I'm walking in the word that God gave me. In the natural, it can't be done, but you hide and watch. Y'all are welcome to come to our dedication November the 3rd. Amen. And you hide and watch. We will be in that building. And I'm believing it'll even be in August that we'll be able to start the school year. And some of you, see, you just immediately, well, I'd never do that. You're sticking yourself out there. You could fail. There are some people that are so afraid of failure that they won't do anything. And they wind up being the biggest failure of all. There's nobody as big a failure as a person who won't do anything because they're afraid of failing. You know, when you're a little kid and you learn how to ride a bicycle, probably most of us didn't do it perfectly the first time. You fell. But you know what? You get up and you go again and now all of us can ride a bicycle. It's the same thing. You have to just step out. Man, I've made enough mistakes along the way, but you know what? God has blessed me in spite of me. God does not, when you fall off your back, God doesn't say, you sorry thing. If you'd have done what I told you, you wouldn't have fallen and you're no good. See if I'll ever help you again. No, he'll get you like a parent and say, look, you went 10 feet, try it again. And he'll encourage you. I'm telling you, you need to get over this fear of failure. The biggest failure of all is when you do nothing. That's a failure. And brothers, I'm saying this to you in love, but I know we can't have this many men together without a lot of people here that you are shooting at nothing and hitting it every time. You are taking the easiest route. You're just floating downstream. And God loves you and I love you, but I love you enough to tell you that God made you for more than that. And in your spirit, if you are born again, you've got everything that it takes for you to succeed. You've already got it all, but you've got to renew your mind. It says in uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 2, don't be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The word transforms, a Greek word metamorpho that we get uh, transformation from, like a caterpillar becomes a butterfly. We get metamorphosis from. And if you want that kind of change in your life, it comes by the renewing of your mind. And you do that through the Word of God. The Word of God is spirit and it is life. And as you start basing your life and everything on what God's Word says instead of what your flesh feels, then you are walking in the spirit and this supernatural life of God will flow through you. You know, I mentioned this woman that I just read her book in the last few days. And she was the one that was an alcoholic, drug addict, uh, PTSD, ADD, bipolar, and all of this stuff. And she was, she was a Christian. And for, I don't know what period of time, but over a decade, she dealt with this stuff. And she was trying to overcome these things and couldn't do it. She actually took a um, razor blade and cut in her stomach. I hate me. And she would slit her wrist and attempt suicide and do all of these things. But the whole problem with her, she was a Christian. She was going to church and Bible studies every week. And sometimes she'd take a fifth of vodka and drink it right before Bible study. She hated herself. She felt like a total failure. But you know, the problem was her, that, she, that was her identity. She thought, this is who I am. I'm a loser. And even though she would go sometimes months at a time, when a temptation would come, she would just identify with it and, and she would fall. And what happened? A friend at Bible study told her, says, this is not who you are. This is not who God made you to be. And just helped her to see that there was a different her living on the inside, not the one that she was seeing in the mirror. And brothers, I can tell you, I, I'm saying this in love, but there are people here that you don't have any faith in yourself. You don't have any confidence in yourself. And you shouldn't have confidence in your flesh, but you should have confidence in who you are in Christ. You should know that God created you for a purpose and he has written down nothing but good in his book for you. 
and you still have that potential. It doesn't matter how far you've gone in the other direction. God has not changed his plans for you. And when you get born again, that old person leaves and you are a brand new person on the inside. You need to get delivered from yourself. You need to get out of this. Some of you have developed a persona that you don't like, but you feel trapped by it. I'm just trying to be honest. I'm not going to be a hypocrite and act like something that I'm not. Well, it's because your identity is in the flesh. But you are perfect in your spirit. You are a brand new person in your spirit. It just depends who you consider to be the real you. If you think the flesh is the real you, then you're a hypocrite to act in love and to go around and say, I'll lay hands on you and you will, you will be healed. Because in your flesh, you don't have that power. But if you are walking in the spirit, you're a hypocrite to start speaking forth all of your limitations and problems and talking about that because that's not the real you. If you feel trapped like, I can't help it, I wish I was different, but this is who I am, it's because you're in the flesh. I'm telling you, in the spirit, you are a brand new person. You're awesome. Amen. Amen. You may not like the way I look or talk. I don't. <laughs> I have my friends make fun of me. <laughs> I've got my 50th anniversary coming up on the 23rd. And people from all over the world sent me greetings. And every one of them would say something and say, well, Andrew called and said, hi there, how are you? And they <laughs> make fun of my voice. You know what? If I was God, I wouldn't have chosen me. But I'm telling you, I'm awesome in the spirit. You just can't see my spirit. And you've got to get to where you go beyond your flesh and find out who you are in the spirit. And you can't do it by looking in the mirror. It's not, you can't, you can't feel it. Some people will say, but I just don't feel like God loves me. Well, then you're in the flesh. Because the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace. In your spirit, you've got so much love that, man, you can't handle any more love. Well, I don't feel it. Well, that just means you're in the flesh. Well, aren't I supposed to feel it? Feelings are fine when they come, but man, if you are being led by feelings, you are a carnal person. You are in the flesh. There's lots of times I don't feel anything. Some of the greatest miracles I've ever seen in my life, I didn't feel a thing. My son was raised from the dead after being dead for five hours in a morgue, stripped naked, with the toe tag on, pronounced dead, and in a cooler. And when they told us about it, man, I felt grief, I felt panic, I felt everything, but I just decided I don't care how I feel. This is what the Word says. Jesus bore my sorrows, carried my grief. I am not going to grieve. I started praising God, and I guarantee you, I did not feel like praising God. But I started praising God, and when I did... Man, faith rose up. I, I started laughing. I told my wife as we were driving right by this property right here. And we didn't have it at that time. That was in 2001. We were driving right by this property. And I said, this is going to be the greatest thing we've ever seen. She thought I'd lost it. And when we got into the springs, my son, just five minutes after they called, he just sat up and started talking. Come on. And that's been 17 years ago, and he is healthy today. He has no brain damage, no more than he had before. And I'm telling you, it was a miracle, and I didn't feel like it. I'm telling you, when you don't feel like it, and you go ahead and do what the Word says, that's the highest form of faith. When you're feeling it, when you have goosebumps all up and down your spine, you're tempted to get out of the Spirit and say, oh, I know God is here because I feel it. Man, that's wrong. If feelings come, enjoy them. I'm not against feelings. I, I have feelings. There's times that I actually feel the power of God flow through me. And when I feel it, praise God. But did you know what? When I don't feel it, I don't act any differently. I am not going to act different because I feel something. That's walking in the Spirit. 
But there's, well, I just don't feel it. Well, pull your thumb out of your mouth and grow up. <laughs> That's childish. I don't know why anybody comes to my meetings. <laughs> but I'm telling you, I do, I'm saying this because I love you. We're guys in here. We're supposed to be adults. And yet we're acting like little kids. Well, you don't understand. I've had this person say this. This has happened. Man, get over it. Well, I was abused when I was a child. It was 40 years ago. Get over it. <laughs> Amen. Brothers, I'm telling you, you're loaded. You got everything that you need. But you aren't going to see this looking in the mirror. You aren't going to have enough people. There's not enough people saying the things that I say tonight. And so you're going to be around a lot of people that will just pull you down to their level. They'll try and tell you, oh, quit thinking that big. You're going to set yourself up for failure. First thing a doctor will tell you is don't get your hopes up. They'll give you a worst case scenario. Man, the very thing you need to do is get your hopes up. The whole world system is against everything I'm talking about. You aren't going to get this in very many places. The only place you can consistently get this is through the Word of God. You're going to have to get into God's Word, which is spirit and, and life, and you are going to have to meditate on this until you see yourself differently. And there may be things in your flesh, and I'm not talking about just your physical body, but in your emotions and in your actions and things that you don't like. But I can guarantee you, your spirit is perfect. And if you could ever start seeing who you are and say, this is who I am, and this is the way I'm going to live. Brothers, you'd go home different. You would be a different person. Some of you were raised that, well, we just don't show much affection. We just are, you know, tough people. We don't express our emotions and stuff like that. That's your flesh. In the spirit, you're full of love and joy and peace. And you ought to start just acting like you are who God says you are. You ought to go and just lay hands on people because the Bible said believers will lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. And without having any kind of light, blinding flash of light, just do what God's Word says and it would shock you what would happen. I'm telling you, there's so many times that I've done things that in the natural it just didn't look, I didn't feel a thing and yet some of the greatest miracles I've ever seen happen or when I felt nothing. It's when you go ahead and do what the Word says, when you don't feel like it, that's the highest form of faith that you can get. You're walking in the Spirit. So it just is this simple. Walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Walk in what God's Word says about you. You can't do that until you find out what God says about you. You need to learn but man, you need to dig in and once you get that and start walking in the I've been talking the whole time about the power of God's word. And last night or yesterday afternoon, I guess it was yesterday morning, I shared from Mark chapter four, verses 26 through 28 about how the kingdom of heaven is the word of God is like a seed. And this physical, natural world depends upon seeds for everything. All life comes from seeds. And you can't just pray over ground. You have to plant a seed. You can't just pray for children. You have to plant a seed for children. Likewise, the Word of God is a seed. The Word of God is to the kingdom of God the way that seeds are to this natural world. If people understood that, then I guarantee you it would answer so many, many, many questions. There are so many people that are praying and asking God for things and aren't seeing it come to pass, but they haven't sown seeds. They don't understand the power of word. And just like a seed has to be planted and you have to sleep and rise night and day and give it time to work and the earth brings forth fruit of herself, you don't even know how it happens. Uh, first the blade, then the ear, and then the full corn. That's what I talked about yesterday. If you understood those principles, I guarantee you it would set the course for the rest of your life.
because God has given us everything that we need. It's in us, in our born-again spirit, and the Word of God just simply activates and draws out of your born-again spirit the abundance that God has already placed in you. Those are powerful, powerful truths. I want to go into this same chapter and today look at the parable of the sower sowing the seed. This is given in the first part of the book of, uh, or the chapter, fourth chapter of Mark. He gave this parable and then his disciples came to him and he says, interpret to us this parable. Why do you speak to them in parables? And Jesus began to tell them basically that the word is hidden for them, not from them. That they have the Holy Spirit to reveal things to them. And then he said this in Mark chapter 4 verse 13. He says, know ye not this parable? How then will you know all parables? <laughs> this is basically him saying that this is a key to understanding everything he taught. If you don't understand the parable of the sower sowing the seed, you won't be able to understand any of the other parables that he's given. So this places an importance on this that is just tremendous. And I remember when God really began to speak this to me, I can tell you exactly where Jamie and I were. It was right after we got married. We were staying at a friend's uh, trailer at, uh, in Quinlan, Texas. And it was on a Saturday night and God spoke to me through these things. It has literally changed my life and my life has never been the same since I began to understand this parable. I don't think that, you know, I've got the full revelation. I'm still getting things out of it, but I mean, it began to work in my life and I've seen great things happen. So if you'll open up your heart today and receive this, this could be a major factor in changing your life. It's that important. So here is the interpretation of this parable. In verse 14, Jesus said, the sower sows the word. Again, this is not telling you how to be a farmer. This is using farming principles to illustrate how the kingdom of God works. The seed is the word of God. The ground is your heart. And this seed was sown on four different types of ground. And I believe that in a general way, you can say that all people's hearts, every person's heart in this place fits into one of these four different types of soil. Every person in here is in one of these groups of people where their heart, how their heart was. The very first one in verse 14 says, these are they that are sown by the wayside where the word is sown, but when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the seed that was sown in their hearts. So the very first uh, type of heart, and let me just preface this all by saying in 1 Peter chapter uh, 1, verse 23, it says that we are born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed by the word of God that lives and abides forever. And so the word of God is incorruptible. In the natural realm, there are some seeds that just rot or somehow or another lose their potency and you don't always see every single seed produced. But the Word of God is an incorruptible seed. So in this first type of soil where the Word was sown, it wasn't a problem with the Word. It was a problem with the heart, the way that people received it. And it's the exact same thing here. There is not a single person in here that has any problem that the Word of God cannot solve. The only difference is how you receive it, the way your heart is, whether you mix it with faith or whether you're operating in fear. The Word of God is consistent. If you've seen the Word of God change any single person's life, it has the exact same potential in your heart. It's never the Word that's a problem. It's always the person that's receiving the Word that has a problem. And some people don't like that and they say, well, you're saying that it's my fault. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> and I know that bothers some people for them to think that, but you know what, man, it is so much security to find out that the word is perfect. It is an incorruptible seed. It's not the word that's a problem. If there's any problem, it's with me. And there are people that just, I can't just, I can't live with myself if I believe I've got a problem. Well, man, you've, you've got a serious problem. 
you, you have all kinds of flaws. We're all fallen creatures. We're in varying stages of being restored and set free by the word of God. If you think that somehow or another you're always right and it couldn't be your fault, well, then that's one of your big problems right there. You don't understand who you really are. You don't understand your tendencies. So the word is incorruptible. It's not the word that's the fault. But this first type of person is a person that was hardened. The word never even penetrated the ground. You know, I'm sure that there's somebody who's come to this meeting who you came because somebody drugged you here. You didn't want to be here and you're just sitting there and you're hearing the exact same words that are changing other people's lives. I believe this has been an awesome conference already. I believe that people's lives are going to be changed. If the Lord tarries, there will be people 20, 30, 40 years from now look back. And this is where God sowed seeds in their life that are changing them. And there's awesome things happen. We've already seen deaf ears open. We've seen people with multiple sclerosis ill. We've seen all kinds of miracles happen. And there are people that are being changed. There are some sitting in this auditorium that are hearing the exact same words and you'll leave this place. And if somebody said, what was that about? You can't even remember. Satan steals it from your heart. You know why? Look over here in Mar Matthew chapter 13. This is the exact same parable just recorded in one of the different gospels. And it's stated just a little bit differently. In Matthew chapter 13 and in verse 19... It says, when anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in their heart. This is he which receiveth seed by the wayside. So this first type of person is a person who didn't understand the word of God. This is the reason you've got to make the word simple. You've got to make it plain. You know, I was brought up in a church. It was a Baptist church and it was kind of a highbrow Baptist church. And we had the people from Southwest Baptist Theological Seminary that would come and substitute when the pastor was gone. And they were these intellectuals. And they thought that somehow or another, it was wonderful preaching if they used big words. I mean, I literally sat and looked up words in a dictionary trying to understand what they were saying. And people thought this was, that you're so deep. That's not good. You have to be able to communicate so simply that people understand it. I can understand, I can accept rejection. I can accept people rejecting what I've said. But for people not to understand what I'm saying, now that's an indication, that's a blight against me. And there are some people that just somehow or another try and speak in ways that people can't perceive what they're saying. And Satan just comes immediately and steals away the word because they didn't understand. This is what's behind us having children's church is where you minister to people on their level. You know, it's the same truths that set children free that set adults free. But if you come and talk to a five-year-old and say, you know what, if you continue to act that way, your marriage will never make it. You're going to get, you, they will divorce you. You'll never be able to hold a job because, and you use those kind of illustrations for a five-year-old, it just goes over their head. So you have to talk to a five-year-old and use illustrations that they can relate to. It's all about understanding. Understanding is like the very first step in the Word of God producing. You have to get it below the ground. And if a person doesn't even understand what you're saying, then it, it never gets below the surface. And Satan just has access to it. There were four different types of hearts uh, talked about right here. And Satan only had total access to one of them. That's this first one who didn't understand. If you do not understand truths about the word of God, Satan has complete freedom to come steal the word from you. So the very first step is you've got to understand. The book of Proverbs says wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom and with all your wisdom, get understanding. You've got to understand the truths of God. And you know, this is the reason that I became a teacher. I started out being an evangelist, trying to just get people born again, witnessing to people. And I saw that they were repeating a prayer after me, but there was no real change in their life. And as I prayed about it, the Lord showed me that I, he had anointed me to explain things to people. 
and I, I guess I'm partial to this. It's not the best ministry or anything, but it's the one that I'm in. And I, God has just put a passion on my heart to try and explain things so that people understand how the kingdom works. It's one thing to say God wants you to get healed, but how do you get healed? It's one thing to say that God loves you, but how could he love somebody like me? I thought Greg just did a great job last night illustrating that the whole universe, all of creation is here for us. God did this for us. You have to explain things so that people can understand it. And I, I can just say this, that you aren't going to get understanding unless you pursue it. You have to pursue it. You have to desire to understand the things of God. So it's not enough just to say, God, I know that you want to bless me. Bless me. Well, how does he bless you? Get into the word of God and let the word of God get down beyond your understanding. And that's the first step in getting the word of God operative in your life. Let me also say that in my, I can't prove this to you from a scripture, but in my way of understanding, I believe that these are four progressive steps that every person goes through. The very first thing is you just don't have a heart for God. You don't think about the things of God. You hear somebody say something and you aren't even given to it and it never gets below the surface. But then the second step is the second person here is listed in the 16th verse. It says, and these are they likewise, which were sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word immediately receive it with gladness and have no root in themselves and so endure but for a time Afterward, when affliction or persecution ariseth for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. So the second type of person is a person who did begin to understand the word of God and got excited over it and rejoiced at it, but they didn't have root in themselves. I talked about this yesterday just a little bit when I used this parable about the mustard seed and how it, you know, I had this vision of having a worldwide ministry and God showed me that my root is about that deep. And if he gave me a worldwide ministry with the root that I had at that moment, the first bird to land on a branch would knock the whole tree over. And so he told me to just focus on the root. And this is what this is talking about. And I remember that Jamie and I had just gotten married and we were still in the Baptist church and I was teaching. I used to go over to Kenneth Copeland's meetings uh, he held a monthly meeting at Will Rogers Auditorium in Fort Worth, and we were living in Seagoville at that time. And um, anyway, we we had to drive hours to get there, but we would go to his meetings, and I'd get all fired up. Man, I'd come back excited, and I'd go into my Baptist church. I had a Sunday school class, and uh, it's a long, long story, but they they didn't like the way I taught because it wasn't Baptist. So they gave me this class that there was only two or three people in. And they, they did, I didn't have a room to meet in. So we met in a bus that had been stripped and there was no seats in it. It was just blank. And so I put carpet in this bus and took these two or three kids out there. And within a short time, we had 50 or 60 kids in this thing. And then I moved a house onto the property. And it was a three-bedroom house that was derelict, but nonetheless, it, 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 was, it was usable. And we grew to 300 kids in that thing. And I was preaching, and great things were happening, but boy, they did not like what I was saying and would criticize me. So anyway, I'd go, and I'd listen to Kenneth, and I'd get fired up, and I'd come back, and I'd preach the word. And we would see people's lives changed, and great things would happen, and the pastor would come and criticize me. And he never totally rejected me, but just you're getting too far out there and just criticism, you know, that's persecution. Sometimes we don't recognize it because if you aren't physically threatened, people don't think it's persecution. But just people criticizing you and speaking against you and stuff, it's persecution. So anyway, for a week or two, I'd be okay, but then I'd lose it. And I'd go and I'd be preaching the exact same things that I heard Kenneth Copeland preach. And there was no results. And it was just bad. And then I'd go back to Kenneth's meeting, and I'd get fired up, and I'd come back and preach, and we'd see good things happen for a couple of weeks, and then I'd lose it. And it happened so many times over a year's period of time that I got to where I was anticipating it. I knew it would happen. I even told Jamie, I said, I don't know why, but it'll be good for a week or two, and then it'll just be dull. People won't be receiving anything. 
And we were just gotten married. We were in this little trailer that I was telling you about. And we were studying this and God spoke to me and he says, the reason that happens is because you don't have root in yourself. You're preaching another man's revelation. It's not your revelation. And what I was saying was true. And I don't know how to even describe this, but it depends on what's in your heart. The word that comes out of your mouth, it depends on what's in your heart as to what effect it has. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse 10, for with the heart man believes and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. It's not only saying the right things. There are people that can sit there and say, by the stripes of Jesus, I'm healed. But is that coming from your heart? Is it rooted in you? Is it established in you? Or are you just parroting what you've heard somebody else say? And there's a lot of Christians that you can say the right words, but it's not established in your heart. And this is what the Lord showed me, that I was preaching another man's revelation. And when I got criticized for it, I would back down, I would be offended and things like this. It says right here in this verse, it says immediately they are offended. That doesn't mean that immediately they rejected it. No, you can still believe it. You can still believe and say, I know that this is true. But if you're afraid to say it, you know, the word offended here just means that you've lost your enthusiasm. You've lost your confidence in it. You've lost your commitment to it. It doesn't mean that you have to reject anything. You may still believe the right thing, but if you aren't believing with all of your heart, it will not produce. When Philip was, you know, with the Ethiopian eunuch, the Ethiopian eunuch says, I believe, here's water, what hinders me from being baptized? And he says, if you believe with all of your heart, you may. There's a difference with just believing partially and being partially convinced. Paul said, I'm fully persuaded. And there's a lot of people that are persuaded, but not fully persuaded. They believe, but they don't believe with all of their heart. It says in James chapter 1, that if you lack wisdom, ask of God that gives to all men liberally and upbraids not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavers is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. You've got to believe with all of your heart. And I was preaching the right things, saying the right things, but it was another man's revelation. And you know, there's many people that don't even know that Kenneth Copeland was ever a mentor to me and spoke into my life. And it's because of this verse. I was studying this and God showed me that you are sitting here quoting another man. You're preaching his revelation. And Jamie and I made a decision right then and says, in the name of Jesus, we will never have to sit here and say so-and-so said and quote them. If I hear somebody else speak the truth, I will take it and meditate on it until God spoke it to me, until it becomes my revelation. And I don't always give credit to other people, but it's not because I'm trying to, uh, you know, claim what they've done is my own, but it's that I, I take it and meditate on it until God spoke it to me. There's actually been times that I've been in a service and I've heard somebody say something and I'll meditate on it. Next time I get up, I go to preaching and Jamie says, you were quoting somebody else. And I don't even remember it because I may have heard them say it, but God spoke it to me. It came from God. And you've got to do this. You've got to have root in yourself. And did you know that a plant, when it's growing, there is more growth below the surface than there is above the ground. And most people are more into the results. They want to believe God so that they can prosper, as Paul was talking about, so that they can get their body healed. They're looking at this results and that's what they're after, but they don't, they don't want to go through the growth process. Notice it says, these people receive the word with gladness, but had no root in themselves. Over the years, I've learned that sometimes the people who seem to be the most excited, man, they are the most vocal. They will shout and scream and run with the best of them. I've learned to be cautious towards people like that because, man, I want to see some, some fruit, some root in you before 
I get really excited. There's a lot of people that look good on the outside, but they're a mile wide and an inch deep. And I'm telling you, that is not a godly thing. I'm saying this in love to you, and I, I appreciate you coming here on a Saturday morning. I'm not mad at you, but I'm telling you, some of you are just, you're just good on the outside. You look good, and inside there's just nothing that is established. You're a mile wide and an inch deep, and this is the reason that you aren't bearing fruit. And you say, oh, I believe that. But do you believe with all of your heart? Do you waver? You've got to get this so rooted in you that you believe the word of God more than the word of a doctor, the more of a the word of a lawyer, the word of your spouse, the word of anybody else. It's got to be to where this is just the way that it is. And it takes time and it takes effort to do that. You know, when I was in school, I got in trouble for talking. And the, my, my preacher not preacher, my teacher, uh, Jimmy Williamson, he put me right in front of his desk so that he could keep an eye on me. And anyway, I remember this one experiment that he did. He had these two terrariums that were about this tall. They were big terrariums. And he planted a tomato seed in both of them. One of them had like a foot of dirt in it. The other one had like an inch of dirt. And he planted the seeds in both of these terrariums. They stayed in identical places. They had the same heat, the same light. We watered them exactly the same every day. And he just left them there. And it was a visual thing to me in the sixth grade. And the one that was in one inch of dirt was the first one to sprout, which surprised me. But it sprouted, and I think that the reason was because it didn't have enough depth of earth to put down roots, so it only had a tiny root. It had to put all of its growth into above the ground. And so that thing sprouted, and it was over a foot tall before you could see the first little sprout in the other terrarium. But it couldn't maintain the growth. And I mean, within a very short period of time, that thing turned white and shriveled up and died and never produced any fruit because it didn't have the root system to be able to support it. The other one just barely had come above the surface by the time the other one had died. And it went on and we had to stake it and it produced tomatoes. And it was just amazing. And that was the difference because it had a root system. Man, that is huge. This is huge. And everybody, again, I believe these are four stages that you go through. You go through a time when the Word of God, you aren't even interested in it. You aren't uh, paying attention to it. It's just you're hardened and you don't even think about it and Satan just steals the Word from you. But then you get to a place where, no, I want the Word in my life. You're excited about it. But do you take the time for the Word of God to just become rooted and grounded into you to where it's established. You know, I have trees that I cut down at my place and I've tried to pull up some of those stumps and stuff. And man, it is just amazing. The root system. Once you get a mature tree, I guarantee you, it's you just aren't going to get all of those roots out of there. They are deep. And you need to get the word of God established in you that nothing can take it away from you. Look in verse 7. Uh, verse 18, it says, or excuse me, verse 17, and they have no root in themselves and so endure but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution cometh for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. Affliction and persecution are designed to get the word of God out of your life. What Satan was doing in my life, I was receiving the word and I was excited about it and I believed it enough that it was working in me and I would share it with other people. But when affliction and persecution came, I turned my attention away from what God was saying, away from God, and I put it on me and I got to feeling sorry for me. And that's what affliction and persecution is designed to do, is to get you off of the word of God and get you to thinking about yourself. God created us for fellowship. You know, Greg was teaching on this last night. It was just awesome. And that's what we're made for. There's something inside of every one of us that wants to be accepted. We want people to love us. If you like people rejecting you, something's wrong with you. God didn't create you for rejection. 
He created you for love. There's a homing device in us. It just wants people to love us and accept us. So an effective thing for Satan to do is to have people come out against you and criticize you and say things against you. And if you aren't careful, you know what that will do? It will get your attention off of God and off of the word and off of the things that he's showing you. And you'll get to thinking about yourself and thinking about how do I solve this situation. And even if you were to justify yourself, you would no longer be preaching the words. You would no longer be standing on the word. You know, I had, during this exact period of time, Joe Nay, who was a guy who was like a mentor to me and got me going, he used to hold meetings and he would have two or 300 people in his service. And I'd go over to his meetings and he called me out during this exact time that I'm describing where I would do good for a week or two, but then people would criticize me and I'd lose it. And he called me out and he had a vision and he saw me and he says, you're like a runner on one of these oval tracks. And he says, I see you running on this track and you're leading the race. But he says, the people in the grandstands are yelling at you and saying, you're doing it all wrong and they're criticizing you. And he said, I see you getting off of the track and running up into the grandstands and arguing with the spectators. And he says, even if you win the argument, you're going to lose the race. He says, forget the spectators, stay on track, stay on track. And man, that was a word from God. That's what this is talking about. Affliction and persecution is designed to get you over here arguing with people about things that are unimportant, trying to justify yourself. You know, years back, this is before Paul was with us. It wasn't Paul that did this, but the director of our ministry at the time, uh, he came to me with some of the staff and they started showing me blogs that people had written about me. And uh, there are apparently thousands of blogs on the internet about how I'm such a terrible person. One of them said that I'm the most dangerous person in America and they just <laughs> blast me and say all kinds of terrible things. So anyway, they brought these to me and they said, we've got to stop this. And they showed me four or five of them and uh, says, we, we got to do something. And I said, look, guy, and I told him this story about me running on the race. I said, forget it. I said, I don't want any of my resources going to trying to justify me and explain things away. Just forget it. Well, four or five months later, they came and they showed me more blogs. And they said, we found out that we can block this and we can do something to, to counterbalance these negative things that are said about you. And I got a little upset with them. And I said, look, I am not going to take one dollar of my resources and start using it to try and justify me. I said, people who don't like me aren't going to like me. And it's not up to me to defend myself. I said, I am going to put everything I've got into preaching the word and changing people's lives. And I told him, I said, don't ever come to me with this again. <laughs> but this is what affliction and persecution is, is designed to do. It's not from God. People who teach that God is doing this to you to break you and to make you better. The scripture right here says affliction and persecution comes to steal away the word that's been sown in your heart. It's to get you off of the word of God and get you over here to feeling sorry for yourself and justifying yourself and thinking about it's not fair what this person is doing. You just need, you need to have something bigger than yourself to live for. You are not the most important thing. Boy, that does not compute with most Americans. Boy, in America, it's get all you can, can all you get, and then sit on your can. And that's what the American dream is. But you know what? There's something bigger than you. You got to have something bigger than you to live for, something more important than you. You got to have a purpose, a goal, and you got to commit yourself to it and not get off the track and up into the grandstands arguing with the spectators. Satan will use that to steal the word from you. Who cares what people think? Let me rephrase that. We shouldn't care what people think. But again, all of us have this tendency to be desire. We desire for people to love us. And it is effective when people start criticizing you. Most people, that just affects you, but it shouldn't. 
You know, one of the ways I deal with it is exactly what Greg was talking about last night about, man, God Almighty loves me. And I stay focused on that. And I still don't like it when people dislike me. I'm sure that there's people at this meeting that are going to go out and criticize me. You know, if you came here looking for something wrong, <laughs> I got something for you. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I've never done anything perfectly in my life. I make mistakes. I do things wrong. And if you came here critical, you can find something to criticize. But the way I deal with it is to say that, God, you know all of my flaws better than anybody else does. And yet God loved me and God chose me. And I'm just so thankful. I stay focused on how much God loves me and compared to God, you're nothing. <laughs> I had a man come up to me after one of my services and just start reading me the riot act and telling me everything I'd said wrong and all of this stuff. And I just stopped him in the middle and I said, who died and made you God? And he says, what do you mean? And I said, you know what? Compared to God, you're nobody. And God loves me. And if God loves me, I just don't give a rip what you think. And he got really offended, like, well, you should. And I said, well, I don't. I said, you're nothing. You're nobody. <laughs> and I know some of you don't like that, but that's the reason... That's the reason you get so offended when somebody says something contrary to you is because you just have to have everybody love you. I don't have to have your approval. I don't have to have you validate me. God Almighty loves me and I know that he loves me.